very much for taking the time to talk to me about it. I, I thought it was important, at least at my level, that I um, share a little bit of the, the story behind contracting COVID. I, I think um, it was particularly difficult for me in the beginning, uh, mentally, because of how uh, serious I was for the longest time about um, not only uh, compliance with the regulations, but also the, for instance, the correct wearing of the mask and social distancing and all of that. And coming at the backdrop of that was, it was quite um, a difficult journey in the beginning. So what happened with me is that I, um, during December, I took a decision to spend some time with my family, something I hadn't done in a while with my extended family. Um, including my parents and my siblings uh, and of course uh, uh, cousins and what happened then is I traveled to Wahanas which is a small village um, you know two and a half hours from here and uh, what has happened and this is really my suspicion because you can never be sure where you really contracted COVID that's that's the that's the difficult part but I can imagine that when I was at the and Wakanas, what has happened is, you know, you, you go there as a family, and, and then I actually tested, uh, maybe just two weeks before I tested negative for COVID. So I was certain that I was clean when I had gone to the farm to visit my family, along with my family here in Bentuk. So we were quite a large contingent of family members interacting. Um, now, what typically happens is that when you are in a family setting, um, firstly, you know, I, I don't think there was enough vigilance on our part as we got there to um, to check on, I mean, it's difficult to check on the status of people who live in a village, for instance. So, whilst in the first of maybe one day or even uh, the first few hours you're consistent in the wearing of masks and, you know, social distancing is reasonably difficult for family members when they're interacting, they haven't seen you in a while. What we're unable to control is, while I remained at home, particularly with my elderly parents, for the most part, uh, you know, actually for all the part, except for when I was going to stay um, at another granny's house, uh, which was a few meters away from the main house, so to speak. And there were, at any given time, there were over 22 people uh, at the house. And you know, because the family, also when you're in leadership, when people hear from a from small village, the minister is there, there is a constant coming and going um, at the house. People come and greet you. Uh, what I do remember distinctly, though, is that I have maintained the wearing of my mask, for instance, when people from outside came. But it became a little bit challenging, I suppose, when um, I had to, you know, when you were at home, you had just finished eating and you have drinks and then the family is interacting. Uh, it's quite difficult to continuously wear your mask because you, you trust that your family members um, are okay. But in the family members, you also have particularly young people there were at least 15 or so young people, and I'm talking now about teenagers of various cousins and nieces and nephews interacting with each other. So they do also interact with other members of that community, and you know, so they don't stay at home. So you stay at home, <laughs> but they go out and they, you don't know what they're exposing themselves to, you don't know who they're interacting with, and they come back and, and so, I'm just imagining, because during those first few days, and I'll tell you in a minute when it started, is during those first few days, I had actually um, uh, thought, you know, you, you know, of course, when, you, when the kids are leaving the yard, you're telling them, you know, wear your mask, remember to maintain social distancing, you don't know who you're going to be interacting with. Um, so, so that message, um, at least from my perspective, uh, was always preached, but also I noticed that when people saw me, you know, they would always put on their mask, but you know, people only do that. It's like this traffic situation, you know, you only put on your seatbelt when, when you see the traffic officer, but one doesn't know um, what happens when, when the traffic officer is not there. 
so so I think when so then I came and I was there for three days uh, with my family and I then went to visit a friend of mine um, you know along with my partner we went to and my sister we went to Swakop and that very first night when I got there on the 27th uh, I really had a terrible fever on the 27th. So, so um, I ended up just spending all the time that I was in Sokop, I was then indoors. So the first night that I experienced this was uh, on the 27th of December, where I would wake up completely wet from uh, the heat, you know, on my body and the sweating. And on the 28th, I remained at home. I requested a few things to, from the pharmacy, you know, to deal with the cold. Because it's also, the, it's really typically, it, it happens that it's, you know, you feel like you have a cold and then you're feeling hot and you're feeling cold. And, and then you have this burning sensation uh, that's quite uncomfortable on your body. Typically, if you had a serious cold, that's what will happen or a flu. And so I, I had then sp spent the day um, in bed, you know, trying to uh, take the various uh, flu tablets and, and medicine that I had uh, gotten. Uh, and then I, I then made a decision that, you know, and I, I had a, a very acute feeling inside of me that this is, this is not like the usual flu that I would get because, you know, I've been familiar with what that feels like. And I started to feel a little bit uncomfortable about whether this could potentially be. So I tried to isolate myself already because then I started to have a sore throat uh, on the second day and, um, you know, a tight chest. And, and so I thought, okay, you know, this could potentially... And, and then I said to my sister and, and my friend that this could potentially be corona. So I'm going to, you know, when we head back to Vintuk, uh, it's best maybe that I go for a test. So we got back to Vintuk on the 29th and, um, you know, and then I felt a little bit better and I said, okay, maybe because sometimes, you know, these things can play a mental game on you. I figured, you know, maybe I, I was just hallucinating and whatever. And I felt quite okay on the 30th um, and, you know, on the 31st, uh, I had, you know, again, my family came over to my house and, you know, we had an interaction and it wasn't anything. And I wasn't, I was, I probably only spent uh, at most two hours with them when I got that onset of almost like an avalanche of the, of, of those symptoms. So I resigned to my room that night and I spent uh, all of that time trying to figure out, and then on the Monday, I decided to then go, or the following day, I decided to go for a test. And I was, I had done the coronavirus test at least four times until that moment. So, but, but this time it was different. I had a strong feeling that Okay, maybe this is this is it, you know. And and I started to really think, you know, I could have been exposed, you know, without realizing it in those moments uh, of interaction with uh, particularly family members that were going up and down, and you weren't sure uh, where they were going. I, I'm saying that because, you know, also when you get the virus, it's really difficult to track it. But you know, because if if you have a fluid interaction at a family gathering. Uh, but it's also one of those things that it doesn't really matter where you got it from because uh, it does create a sense of blame and stigma and you want to avoid that. So I try to stay away from trying to think, you know, where could I have gotten it um, and, and those kinds of things. So when I eventually uh, tested uh, positive, and actually, even before that, when I went for the test and I was now waiting for my results, and I waited for my results for about two days or so, I then started to really struggle uh, with breathing. Uh, you know, breathing became extremely painful, particularly taking uh, deep breaths. And so 
what what I then did is, and this is when I started to have a conversation to say, um, when you struggle to breathe like that, particularly when you're taking deep breaths, what you do then is you start to have artificial breathing methods to cope with the pain inside. So, um, and I can completely understand if you have, you know, maybe other what they call comorbidities, if you have asthma, if you may be a little bit overweight, or you always had a chest or breathing problem, I can completely understand that why sometimes people would then simply not do it and then your, your oxygen levels go down dramatically. Uh, and so I, I then, you know, started to, to breathe superficially and I had a tight chest, but of course, uh, w once I discovered that I, I was positive, I had now informed the nation and I had informed uh, some of my friends and of course everybody was now giving you advice about what, what to do and so forth. But it wasn't long after, maybe two days uh, into this breathing challenge that I had, I was hospitalized because, you know, my oxygen levels then uh, dropped quite dramatically uh, below, below the required uh, 90, uh, I don't know, 90 something uh, that you need to have. And, and so, you know, I got concerned, but I think I got a little bit more concerned when I started, you know, spitting blood, you know, my mucus had blood in it. And, 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 and my doctor then had, uh, had, I suppose, got concerned that my lungs could, could have been damaged by the virus. So. I was then taken up at the medic clinic uh, for three full days where I was on an oxygen machine uh, and I was then also subjected to some uh, what they call breathing exercises with a physiotherapist. So I think uh, throughout that process, I can tell you, I had spent an enormous amount of time uh, steaming, uh, you know, and of course, once it turned out that I was uh, positive, you know, then everyone else around me had to be tested, which now <laughs> included uh, this big group of people, including my family uh, at my parents' house in Kututura, the people in Wakanas. Uh, and of course, uh, my, my my nuclear family at my house, and and everyone got tested, and everyone was positive because we were all, you know, clearly interacting with each other, and 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 then of course the next challenge that comes is if it is only me, you know, that have to think about uh, the eucalyptus oil and the mints and all the vitamins and all the foods that you need to eat. Um, it, it would have not, you, do, you didn't have to really think about cost, but when it became this entire extended family in these various locations, I really had to think about how am I going to finance this? Because, you know, I am the, really the only breadwinner in the entire family. I mean, you know, my sister works and so forth, but, you know, primarily I took everybody to the farm, for instance. So there was an expectation that I would provide the support. And, and I must say that I, I have uh, wonderful friends because then all my friends kind of chipped in to say, you know, here is I will, I'm happy to buy for one family, you know, the food and, and what have you. Because during this time, also I can tell you the biggest, biggest challenge is the fear. And you, it can mentally paralyze you if you're not careful, if you don't descend into that dark place that am I going to live and then people are dying around you and you're hearing, you know, all these familiar names of people uh, succumbing to COVID. And, and so it really uh, requires a lot of support. And I'm not just talking about material support. It's that daily or every other day check-in, uh, for instance, from friends and family. Uh, about what is what is going on, we were all very very concerned because I have a mother of eighty one, and we were a little bit concerned about her condition in particular, um, you know. But it turned out that she was all right, 
I seem to have been the only vulnerable one in the group, you know, because everyone else, including my son um, and, and all the kids, you know, they did not have an issue. You know, they had no symptoms. So even though they had the virus, they did not have the symptoms. But I think it helped um, to, to have had access to, you know, those vitamins and to have the consistent support of, of somebody reminding you to steam. I must tell you, steaming uh, was extremely, extremely uh, useful. Uh, at least if you have a chest issue, if you have um, an attack on your lungs, the steaming really does help. Because it, you know, you, you're dealing with a lot of times about the mucus that sits on your lungs. And it does make your chest tight, and it does make you uncomfortable, and you out of breath. As you can see, I'm still struggling a little bit with breathing for long periods of time uh, without feeling like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm about to lose my breath. So that, that was one thing that really, really helped me. And of course, uh, the, the, the basic things around, uh, you know, taking those immune boosters. I do realize now, uh, on hindsight, that one of maybe the biggest challenge that I've had is the fact that I was not so consistent in checking what I eat and having a kind of structured way of uh, managing my body, whether it's through exercise or doing breathing. I've never, I have never realized how important deep breathing is. I think a lot of us are just um, breathing, we're taking breathing for granted. That's one thing I've realized. I think even uh, you will realize it yourself. Until you have had COVID, you have no idea how important breathing is because it's, it has to do with uh, what kind of saturation you have in your body and your oxygen levels and all of that. Mm. So. <clears throat> It, it, for, for, I, I, so I was in this COVID space, if you'd like, for over 25 days, you know, from the onset on the 27th of December. And I was only able to, you know, be released really uh, on, on the 1st of February. Initially, I was uh, supposed to have uh, been freed into because it's a that's the other challenge you know you mm. remain isolated uh, and in this instance we were isolated in various homes uh, of the families uh, but I then went for a second test and I was still positive because then they had indicated to me so even my second test was positive at the time you know so I had to go through another 14 days of uh, checking my, uh, what you call it, my symptoms and whether or not I'm recovering. So I, I, can, I can tell you, you know, when 1st of February hit, I was able to now say, okay, I'm no longer infectious, uh, you know, and I'm well on my way to, to recovery. It's quite a sad ordeal. My late sister who died from COVID, um, out of probably premonition, asked me for the first time in a long while to to make a turn on her farm, saying that my brother, you have not really spent time with me. Why don't Why don't you make time and come over to 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 my farm? So I go. I went to the farm, and that's where we suspect. That's where we we came into contact with with COVID. My other elder sister's husband was showing the symptoms while we were for the five days on the farm and then after probably the seventh day when we arrived back I started having the symptoms we were not very sure whether it was COVID the next day my wife was also showing the same symptoms and the subsequent days the kids and also started to show the symptoms. So I went in to go and get a swab for a test. What enfeebled me then was the fact that the whole family has contracted this, this very virus. Um, with the children, it was quite very easy. They really fought it easily. I think their immune system is, is much more 
resilient to to enough to, to viruses and, and bugs. So they, they really handled it. I mean they they had it but complaining a little bit here about not tasting and that and the other. But me and the wife it was a struggle. To me I was three weeks at home, you know, trying to fight it, the usual doing hot stuff, um, you steam, you you take all the necessary precautions. And after the test came out that I had it, um, the doctor made a prescription, steroids, some painkillers and so forth. But hey, COVID is, it's a, it's a virus that, that really decreases your immune system. You start feeling weak and so forth. So coming to my third week, my wife was getting better and I was getting worse. So I had to, I had to, to go in to the hospital for seven days because uh, my 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 breathing uh, was just getting down. We I was supposed to be above 90, 95, and I was getting lower than eighty five. So I had to go in to go and get some oxygen in the hospital. Um, um, the experience was that I was not really, I didn't go into ICU, but I was on, 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 on ventilators for some time, for three, four days. But then the whole episode was just a roller coaster. When I went to hospital, my sister was then highly pregnant and she had to come in into hospital because of the love and uh, closeness that we shared. She said to me, now I'm going to, to Lady Pahamba so then I decided that I'll book myself in Lady Pahamba so that we'll, we'll be together. I come the day at four, it's the three o'clock in the morning in the hospital. Hospital is fully, fully booked. I, it kept me there up to 11 o'clock. She was there the previous day, but we couldn't meet. So when, when I really went to the other hospital, to the Roman Catholic, you just hear the news that your sister has passed on. Due to COVID, she delivered a healthy baby and uh, she passed on. Then it was my third, fourth day in a hospital. Uh, now you are fighting for your own recovery. You are fighting for the family to be good. Uh, my father underwent two brain surgery. He has the death of his daughter. He has to go and under a brain surgery because a, a a vein in his head has just burst open. So my father was deeply, deeply ill. He hears the daughter's death, creates a second surgery to him. I'm in hospital. My sister is gone. And it was a very difficult period and moment in a person's life because he taught us that the statistics of COVID are just not numbers. It affects people, it affects families, it breaks families, it brings pain and suffering to a lot of people. And COVID then was no longer a statistic, was a reality within the family to have lost somebody so dear and very close to me. And me also fighting the disease. Now, one thing that it does to you is that it weakens your 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 immune system that's one and then your muscles there's always a, a deep contraction of muscles that one day we had to come out to the funeral and everything and one day i've just decided to go for a walk and generally i'm a person who exercises and just through this exercise i go with probably two two and a half kilometers. And when I reached a, a hill, I was just shivering and collapsing. So for many, many days, I haven't even went back to my normal self of really, of really exercising the way I used to do because you, you have this consistent shot of breath. Now it is getting way better. The other day on the farm, um, <laughs> life is such a, 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 a mysterious, it works in a very mysterious way. You know, I, my father was ill, I was ill, my sister died. 
and on my farm they steal 70 cattle thinking that I'm going to die. When they hear that my father who is in a nearby neighbor and myself are in hospital, they started slaughtering cattle. Over 60, 70, 68 cattle, cows were just slaughtered by inside job and some syndicates, so they hit on me. So after a period, I went back to the farm to go and recollect what is whatever is there now. And uh, when I arrived, I, I, I went on a horseback, thought, thinking that I was really okay to ride. So I ride for an hour or so, looking in the camps and so forth, but because there's a lot of water in it. And when I arrived home, getting off the horseback, I had to go into bed because my whole body was shivering. You know, telling me that your muscles, the, the, the muscles don't get, don't get back on time. The tune of muscles are not yet there. But they say apparently you could recover in a period of two or three months. So the recovery to me was quite very slow. Now I feel a little bit better. In fact, I want to try a horse maybe this weekend or so if time permits. But I feel a little bit better. So I, I want to go back to the gym now, doing it slowly, the, the little slow uh, exercises just to get the strength of the muscle back. At least now with the short, short of breath, it, it has re I've recovered. Because when I used to come up the stairs here, seven, if I arrived at the seventh stairs, I had, to, I had to, to, to stop for a minute or two just to recover the breath. But now I can do like back and forth and still not lose a shot of breath. So that is the recovery part that is quite very, very slow. Mine was very slow due to probably the psychological impact of also the death of my sister. Um, but generally, one would want people to really take good care because what it does is that um, it hits people in very different ways. At home, I mean, my first week was okay. I thought I would take it slowly. But the second week, you become a prisoner of a bed. Is that prisoner there? You, you become a prisoner of, of your surroundings because you are just in a bed. You wake up, you eat a little bit, you are in a bed. And that I think that that is the time that one has to make a choice whether you want to survive or not. Because it's a, I think it is a psychological thing. Because if you give in, there was a time that I wanted to give in. And then I said to myself, give in unto what? Give in unto death? Give in unto what? And I said, let me fight this thing. So that spirit invoked, uh, in, in, invoked an awakening in me to say that no, um, let me fight this disease because I, I, I had a heart, open heart surgery. So now for people that have certain conditions, especially heart conditions, not that I have a heart sickness, but I, they, I had to open up one of my vein block and I got a stroke. So, so, so I knew that I had conditions that were not in tandem with fighting the disease because it, it would have weakened me. But the spirit, the mental spirit kept me, kept me going. And of course, without uh, saying it loud, there are a number of Namibians uh, that really send messages. You sometimes, you don't really value yourself until other people start sending you um, well wishes, the prime minister, the president, my colleagues in parliament, uh, members, leaders of parties, uh, friends across the world, presidents of country across the world, you know, uh, that knows me, prime ministers, foreign ministers of nations, no really showing uh, empathy with you and really pushing you to, to, to fight it out. So, so that, that really also brought me back because ordinary Namibians, I mean, somebody would just send a messenger and said, without you, politics will not be the same with this. So you, those people also uh, help to really galvanize your fighting spirit to really fight back. But it was an ordeal one would not want to experience because um, it, 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 is, it is a dangerous virus. And especially if your mental strength is not there, you could easily succumb to it. Because there were days that you just couldn't breathe. You know that you're, I'm gonna die because the breathing is just not there. But you had to push on. And so in the hospital, they also gave you a number of um, exercises to exercise the lungs, I never knew. As a former heart patient, I know how to, but when they take your heart out and operate on it, they, they teach you how to walk, they teach you how to talk. So it was, for me, strange that the lungs can also be exercised. There's this bottle that you have to bubble to 
basically to exercise the lungs and there's a number of exercises that you have to do to get the lungs going so it was quite very interesting the therapist the medical staff and everybody that were around me were a very superb group of people that really had a mission to make me recover and uh, i complied they said i was a difficult patient but to be that as it may i i survived by the grace of the lord and i'm back again to my former self uh, the mental agility is still there still thinking uh, still fighting on for a better day for a better country for a better people so that's my experience in a nutshell with, with covid 19. yeah um, let's just talk about the stigma around uh, being tested positive for COVID-19. Um, what is the stigma? How are you and have you been dealing with that? Well, well, I think there is the stigma is there to those that knows the extent of the disease. People don't, especially at the death of my sister, when I came in, you know, people were very hesitant to, to come close to me. To, so the stigma is there. But generally, we also have a very loose society that doesn't really care. The general public really do not take COVID seriously. I mean, uh, you have to tell people that you that you that you need to mask up. Uh, like I was in the south of the country and I was seeing people at rallies. Half of the people don't have masks. They, they just come like that, and you, you get worried because it's it's a vulnerable. It's people with a weak nutritional dietary system that that could be really affected by this virus so you don't want people to but the stigma still exists amongst people you know my <laughs> probably the biggest stigma was my security officer he was so careful um, that um, he just never came to work you know i'm saying so, so you mean they won't kill me because i have covid or what? Well, there's already a death warrant but it was good so i let him also stay home and i said no it's okay it's a, we have a peaceful country relatively very peaceful country we shouldn't worry about that but the stigma is there but we have to deal with it. And those that are stigmatizing people are not really wrong, but they are wrong in thinking that after having had COVID, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't recover. You do recover, and and, and I'm recovered, and I got a health clearance that I'm negative now. So that's why I'm back at work.